What's going on, analysts? In this episode, we had a chat with Jonathan Softly, one of the candidates running for IACA president. You've heard him talk about his platform, and you've seen him answer some of the tough questions about his campaign. But today, we're going beyond that. We're getting to know who Jonathan is on a personal level, what drives him, and why he believes he's the right choice to lead the IACA into the future. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, Jonathan, uh, let's start with the basics. For those who may not know you yet, who is Jonathan Softly? Tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. Oh, I'm uh, John Toffley. I'm the crime analyst for the City of North Richland Hills Police Department. Um, and I do crime analysis and crime analysis stuff. <laughs> Finished up uh, undergrad. I couldn't find a job, so I did what uh, every good person in undergrad does. I went to grad school and then I uh, was finishing up that. I was like, oh, I need a job. And I didn't know what crime analysis was or anything about it. I just had a bachelor's in criminal justice and a master's in public affairs. And I was sitting there, I was like, I wanna do something with crime. I wanna do something where I like analyze the data. And I literally Googled crime analysis. Bam, I was like, wow, there's a whole field here that I didn't know about. And this was in the early 2000s. Um, maybe mid 2000s because uh, it was 2004 or 2005 and i applied for a bunch of jobs i had some interviews some went really well some were like you're fresh out of college uh, go pound sand and try somewhere else and uh, i had a good interview in austin and they actually it told me oh we think you'd be really good for one of our planner positions but then they couldn't interview me that day for that. And then I get home and uh, I lived in North Carolina at the time. So I had to fly out to Texas and then back all on my own dime as a poor grad student. And they told me that I was their second choice and uh, good luck. And so I had another offer come in from a department down in Florida. And I was getting ready to do, to like schedule their background in polygraph when the city of Austin called me back and said, hey, the first choice that we had, we couldn't like do the salary negotiation with them. Do you want the job? And I was like, yeah, sure. How much are you gonna pay me? And they told me, and I was like, okay, that sounds fair. Cause I needed a job <laughs> I had to move or else I was gonna have to move back in with my parents. So I moved from North Carolina to Texas which is a big change in weather. Um, and I started working down there and just jumped right in the fire on the job training. I did uh, the Alpha Group um, crime analysis uh, class as my first training. I also did the FIAT course that first year as well. And then just over time worked on my skills and been doing this for 19 years, 20 next year. Um, and I'm on my third department. Uh, I was with the Austin Police Department for five years. Then I spent 11 years with the Dallas Independent School District Police Department. And I did a lot more planning and administrative work on that side. And I was like, you know what? I'm tired of administrative analysis and planning. I want to go back to crime analysis. So I found this job with the city of North Richland Hills. I applied for it in 2019. They asked if I was interested in interviewing in 2020. I filled out a background packet and then I didn't hear anything from them until 2021 because of the pandemic. Um, but 2021, they came back and they're like, hey, you sent us a background packet. Are you still interested? And I was like, yes, yes, I am. And so I got the job and uh, I've been here ever since. And it's just been great. Uh, uh, I love the fact that I was able to get back into crime analysis and dealing more with day-to-day -day crimes than administrative stuff and police planning items. Um, I was very good at that, but my passion for that dwindled 
as my workload increased. <laughs> so the moral of the story is don't be too good at your job or you'll do eight other people's jobs. <laughs> so what inspired you to get into crime analysis? Was there a specific moment, person, or program that really sparked your interest? Yeah, so when I started in Austin, um, one of the people I worked with, uh, Danny Santos, uh, may he rest in peace, he passed away several years ago. Um, but he just really took me under his wing. He taught me a lot of things. Um, just the all the analysts at that time in the mid 2000s down in Austin were so good about teaching people things. And so uh, I, I worked with him and he was just an inspiration, which is how he was working. Uh, I met Barry Fosberg. He kind of started in crime analysis the same time I did after he'd moved over from just regular law enforcement. And Barry, you know, he just retired, I guess this year really. And uh, just seeing his journey and everything he's done was very inspiring. And that always kept me going. Um, I consider Barry a very close friend and I was very excited to see just how passionate he was and sharing how the information he knew and teaching people and just crime analysis in general. And then uh, back probably, I wanna say 2018, I wanna say it was, not 2018, I'm sorry, 2008. I wanna say it was Julie Wartall that I saw at, a, at, I think, the last MAPS conference back in Pittsburgh. Um, and she was doing this really amazing presentation about um, looking at uh, United States Postal Service vacancy data through housing and urban development data to look at blight in neighborhoods. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. And so when I came back to Austin, I kind of worked with that some, and I just thought it was just a really amazing thing. And I was like, ah, it's Julie lady, she's awesome. So I kind of like watched what she was doing and everything. And then also, uh, I want to say it was around 2008-ish as well, uh, when Crime Stat 3 was being rolled out, uh, Chris Bruce and uh, Susan Smith, sorry, Susan, I forgot what your new last name is. <laughs> um, and I just saw a post from her today, so I should know. But, uh, you know, they did some training classes on Crime Stat 3, and you had to apply for that. And it was through the ISEA and I think the um, NIJ. And so I applied for one of those classes. I sent my resume, a letter of interest, um, and I got selected to go to the one in Denver. And I learned how to use that. And I, I still use Chrome Set 3 and 4 today. I know that a lot of those tools are in Esri. I just really like using CrimeStat. I, I, I think that it's a one-stop shop where I can go in and put in all the stuff that I want to run and just run it all at once instead of running one thing or another slowly one by one by one. So I can just pull it all out and I can look at the data and decide, okay, is this worth even looking at? Or, oh my God, look at this information. It just validates the fact that I know I'm right about this. And so, yeah, I got things like that really drove me. Then I moved to like the school district and I thought I was going to do crime analysis there. Surprise! That's what the job description said, but it wasn't the job. Um, but I enjoyed working there, um, doing planning work, because I'm really good at planning work. I enjoy it. I was a member of uh, ILE for a while. Uh, it was really sad to see them fold during the pandemic, but I was really good at it. I even did the planners course. And I just got to the point where I was like, you know what? I'm doing so much. I'm working so many hours. I'm a salary employee. I'm getting taken advantage of here. I really want to do crime analysis again. I want to look at crime data. I want to look at things like that. I don't want to be half of IA writing people up like I was. <laughs> and so I threw my hat out there and I looked at um, a 
lot of different jobs. I looked at supervisor, manager jobs. I applied for a lot of them. I interviewed, um, always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Uh, but I was a finalist or if not the final one, like a finalist, one of the two finalists for a lot of those jobs and just never panned out. And then this one popped up here in North Berkshire Hills and uh, it was just timing and it, th this was the right job. This is what the world was saying. It was saying, hey, you're going to find something, but uh, it's not going to be any of these in the places that you want to go. You get to stay in Texas, but you have a 15 minute commute. So that's the bonus you get. Now let's talk about your involvement with the IACA. You've been active in the organization for some time. Can you share what roles you've had and any key contributions you've made that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, so I first joined the IACA back in 2005 when I first became a crime analyst. Um, the Austin Police Department uh, paid for our membership and so I was a member for several years. Then when I left the police, that police department and went to the school district police department, they didn't pay and I am a single income family. So some years I was a member, some years I wasn't. It just depended how things were kind of going for us at home at the time. And then back in 2017, TextLean was created and I saw it pop up on uh, the IACA listserv at the time. I was like, oh, I've been waiting for a Texas group to come back. And so I joined it. And not soon after I joined it, the, they put out a call for people who were interested in being on the first um, training committee. And so I put my information into in that. I didn't know any of the, like, the, the people really that were in charge of that at the time until I, I joined it. And so I joined it. I was working on putting on trainings. And then uh, Mindy Earl, who was the vice president of administration, she relocated from Texas to the Kansas City area. So her position came open. And myself and uh, Drew Dasher were the two training committee people. And it was down to the two of us of who was going to take that vice president administration spot. And it was decided that uh, they wanted to give it to me and let me have a go at it. And Drew was probably sitting there like, oh, thank God, I don't have to be that person who's in charge. Um, sorry, Drew, you're in charge now. <laughs> but so from the end of 2018 until the end of June this year, I was the vice president administration for TextLink. That's the Texas Law Enforcement Analyst Network for those who did not know what TextLink means. And I worked on our annual trainings. We added a webinar series and um, when COVID hit, it was actually something that we had discussed about a year or two prior to that. And at the time it wasn't the direction we wanted to go, but we, we, we did end up taking that. And I want to say, and I, I hope I don't give the wrong credit here, but I want to say it was Kira Gross who came up with the idea originally. And we just didn't take that originally because we were trying to focus on building up our annual training at that time. And so over all these years, I worked with the people in the committee, which has been Drew from the start, who's now the new VP of admin. And I grew that training committee as we grew our training program. And we put on several very successful trainings. It started with like two day classes that were all in the same room. And it was just one track. Then we added in a um, half day that flip-flopped um, between the two days so that people could decide to go to lectures or they could go do like crystal reports or Excel classes. And then we moved and we were like, okay, we can do two tracks this year. And then finally this year, we had um, three days where it was three different classes during the day with keynotes on each morning. 
We've offered the um, IACA certification exam the past two times that we've had our conferences. And uh, I think that we, we had good showing for those with people signing up for it. And it's just something that is, was very rewarding. Like I was able to give back to my community. Uh, I'd always felt like, oh, I can't do any training. I don't know anything that people really need to know. And then when I was in charge of training, I was like, ah, oh, crap, I got to fill this training slot. Like, oh, I'm out of people that I can twist their arms to do something this time around. What can I do to put something on? And so I put out my own little trainings and I was like, okay, well, time to bite the bullet. And uh, and uh, the student must become the teacher here. <laughs> Now, we've heard a lot about your campaign platform and you've addressed some important issues so far, but let's dig deeper. Why do you believe members should vote for Jonathan Softly as the next IACA president? What sets you apart from the other candidates? Well, now that you know a little bit about me, I want to tell you why I think that you should vote for me for the IACA president. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm a pretty jovial guy. I like to have fun, but I'm also professional. Um, as the kids would say, I'm very demure, very professional, and very much wanting to be your next ICA president. I really think that I am the best candidate for this. I come with 19 years of law enforcement experience. I've worked my way up from the very beginning to where I am now. And the biggest difference I think that I have versus my candidate, not the candidate, but my opponent, it is that I very much take a, I wanna hear from you, I wanna to listen to you, and what you have to say to me is what I wanna push. Um, and, and I've said this to people um, that I've talked with, the ICA president, it's not a dictatorship. Just because you're president doesn't mean that you're gonna get what you're asking for. I've listed out things on my platform and you can go look at it on the IAC website, uh, in my statement or in any of my videos or on the podcast with Jason Elder. And I list out things that I as a member have concerns about and I'd like to see changed. That doesn't mean that those are the things that we're gonna be able to do because I wanna also do a strategic plan which involves you, our members, making those decisions. So oh, everything that I want to do is to be the voice of our membership, not the voice of myself. Because there's no need for me to come in and say, we need to have this done. We need to have this done if it's not what the membership wants. So I ask that you vote for me. And if you do vote for me, I hope that you will apply to be part of the strategic planning committee because I wanna take members who are not already on committees and bring them in and expand the voices that we have on the board uh, and in our committees that we already have working. And we have a lot of really good volunteers who've done some amazing things over the years. And sometimes they go unappreciated because people don't understand the amount of work that goes into it. So the one thing to know if you elect me president is that none of the glory is ever mine. I only ever put the glory down on the people who actually do the work, and I wanna make sure that they are recognized. And so that's what I plan on doing. I'm not gonna be a figurehead as the president. I'm gonna be your voice. So you have until October 15th. So if you haven't voted, vote now. And as my little tagline goes, remember, Together, we can make a difference. That's Jonathan Softly, candidate for IACA president. If you liked what you heard or have questions for Jonathan, be sure to let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And hey, if you found this episode insightful, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. If you haven't already, it really helps the channel. See you next time.